And the electricity is in the air on a chilly November night. I'm Carson Daly. Welcome to Corn TV. If you were alive in the 2000s, then I have some bittersweet news for you. You witnessed what was very likely the peak of metal music. And don't get me wrong, there's tons of great metal that came out before and after the 2000s, but that's almost certainly the decade where metal was just on top of the world. For one, because it was at its most popular, with new metal bands selling millions and millions of albums, tours like Ozfest and Mayhem just killing it every year, and the Prince of Darkness himself, Ozzy Osbourne, starring in one of the biggest shows on TV. Sharon! Sharon! But it wasn't just the commercial popularity. The 2000s were also an insane decade of innovation for metal that gave us the rise of subgenres like metalcore, deathcore, and gent that are still really driving the evolution of metal in general. It's also when, in my opinion, metal production was really perfected with recordings that sounded crisp and punchy, but they hadn't yet become totally fake and overproduced. Or at least that's how I see things. And in this video, I will lay out my case so you can answer the question for yourself. Did metal really peak in the 2000s or am I just stuck in the past? And also I'd like to thank Factor for sponsoring this video. Eat stress-free this spring with Factor's delicious ready-to-eat meals. Their fresh never frozen menu is chef crafted, dietitian approved, and ready to eat in just two minutes. And best of all it is delivered right to your front door. It's amazing. That means you can skip the trips to the grocery store and all the chopping and the prep and the cleanup and all that while still getting the flavor and nutrition that you need. And if you eat out a lot, it's also a great way to save money. It's cheaper than takeout or worse, getting delivery, which honestly is a complete waste of money and the food usually sucks. And also they have a ton of options. Personally, I like Calorie Smart, which is less than 550 calories per serving, but they also have options like keto, vegan, or veggie, and many more. I love that I don't have to think about what I'm gonna eat for lunch. I just go downstairs, I pick something, and I know that it's gonna taste good and I'm still gonna hit my macro goals. So if you wanna check out Factor, and honestly, I think you should, head to factor75.com or click the link below and use the code PUNK50 to get 50% off your first Factor box and 20% off your next box. That's code PUNK50 at factor75.com to get 50% off your first box, plus 20% off your next box while your subscription is still active. These days, metal is mostly nowhere near any kind of mainstream popularity or part of pop culture. There's definitely a few blips here and there, like for example, Ghost and Bring Me the Horizon trending on TikTok. And speaking of Bring Me the Horizon, they worked with Ed Sheeran, which was cool to see. Spirit Box did a remix with Megan Thee Stallion. There's definitely these moments, but for the most part, metal is really not anywhere near a mainstream thing. And for anybody under the age of 30 or so, it may be hard to imagine this, but the 2000s were really just a different time for metal. Back then, rock and metal in particular was actually something pretty close to mainstream music. The clearest example of that is probably the very heavy presence of new metal on MTV's show TRL, or Total Request Live, which was their daily show where they counted down the most popular videos as voted by fans. It had the power to really just make or break an artist. It's a big part of why the boy bands like NSYNC and Backstreet Boys got so popular. And what's crazy is that you would see new metal bands on there on a regular basis going toe-to-toe -to -toe for popularity with the absolute biggest pop stars of that era. It was actually so common that the number three spot on TRL became known as the corn spot because corn would always end up coming in third after NSYNC and Backstreet Boys. And like, think about what that means. To put that in today's terms, that would be like a metal band coming in third in popularity after like Taylor Swift and Doja Cat. That's how popular this stuff was. Well, it was a week of good news and bad news for Korn and their fans. The good news being that the long-awaited Korn album, Untouchables, hit the ground running, selling almost 500,000 copies in its first week. The bad news is that the best thing since wrestling Mr. Eminem was himself still untouchable, holding on to the top spot 
on the album's chart for a fourth week in a row. And speaking of Eminem, he also had a little beef with Limp Bizkit and mentioned them in a song at the time where he was just the absolute biggest rapper on the planet. And yes, it was a diss, but the point is that they were part of pop culture. Again, to put that in 2024 terms, this would be like Drake or Bad Bunny mentioning Sleep Token today. Chris Kirkpatrick, you can get your ass kicked worse than them little Limp Bizkit bastards. Fred Durst himself also became a straight up pop star to the point where he was rumored to be dating Britney Spears and he attempted to date Christina Aguilera. He came up short, but you know what? I respect that he took his shot. Christina, I know you might be thinking I'm an idiot, but I'm not. I'm Mike right now, I'm trying to get a response. And new metal was so big that its influence reached all the way to Japan. For example, the main character of the anime Ergo Proxy was based heavily off of Amy Lee from Evanescence. But the popularity of metal in the 2000s wasn't just limited to new metal. There was also Viva La Bam, which was one of MTV's biggest shows at the time, piggybacking on the massive success of Jackass and reaching an audience that went well beyond just the alternative kids and skaters that you might think of as being receptive to metal. Literally everybody watched that show at least a little bit or was at least aware of it back in the 2000s and it was full of metal musical guests including some very legit stuff like Demo Borgir, Children of Bodom, Slayer and of course him who basically owe their entire career to BAM. And so again think about that because of BAM who was this giant MTV star and who obviously loved metal we saw that when he put bands like Believer and Malevolent Creation in the CKY videos because of him bands like Demo Borgir were on prime Time, time MTV. That's just how it was in the 2000s. Metal was everywhere. Although my personal favorite Viva La Bam moment was probably the Guar cameo. Hey, hey, where's that? Holy what? Hey. Another really big pop culture moment for metal was the Osbournes. For anyone who may not be familiar, which sounds weird to say, but the show was 20 years ago, so I guess there's a lot of younger people that never saw it. The Osbournes was a reality show that followed Ozzy Osbourne around and his family, including his wife and manager, Sharon Osbourne, who was and still is a very powerful person in sort of the metal part of the music industry, and his kids who were teenagers at the time, Jack and Kelly Osbourne. And most of the show is just kind of silly stuff like Ozzy trying to figure out how to work their fancy new TV remote. Weak signal, that's about all I What will what's that old fucking day? Weak signal. Jack! But it was more than just that. For one, it made Ozzy and by extension, Black Sabbath relevant to a whole new generation of kids who were too young to have been around for his run back in the 80s and 90s. But it wasn't just him. It also shined a light on a lot of smaller artists that came up in the show. For example, not exactly metal, but when Kelly dated Burt from The Used, or maybe most notoriously when Jack used Meshuga to terrorize their neighbors. Meshuga, death metal from Norway. <laughs> And I know, I know, they're not death metal and they're not from Norway, but whatever. The point is that Meshuga of all bands was getting a shout out on MTV on this massive, gigantic primetime show. Like millions of people were watching the show and how many of them discovered Meshuga for the first time through the show? Jack Osborne also got Meshuga on Ozfest 2002, which in turn got Tool to take them out. And you think about kind of the ripple effect of that. I would say that Meshuga is easily the most influential band on this generation of modern metal. Like pretty much everybody draws influence from them in some way or another. And I think a big factor in that is actually the mainstream exposure that they got from the Osbournes and in turn Ozfest and Tool, which helped them reach an audience that otherwise would have had no idea that they even existed. And speaking of Ozfest, the 2000s were also the golden age of these metal package tours. Ozfest was of course the biggest one, helping bands like Slipknot, Disturbed, Tool, and Papa Roach become the giants that they are, as well as putting on many more 
extreme and underground bands like Decapitated, Hatebreed, Throwdown, and the Black Dahlia Murder, among many, many others, over the decade or so that that tour was in its prime. It was a huge tour that was really just like a fixture of the scene, and in my opinion, it played a huge role in the rise of the 2000s metalcore scene, which I'll talk about in a minute. But it wasn't just Ozfest. There were also these smaller but still good-sized tours like Taste of Chaos and Mayhem, which catered to a little bit more extreme stuff. For example, like Cannibal Corpse and Behemoth, who ironically played on the Hot Topic stage for some reason. These tours were like the centerpiece of the summer for metal kids all over the country and also in Europe when the tours expanded over there, drawing tens of thousands of people to every single show. Along with Warp Tour, which was not really a metal tour per se, but always had some heavier bands on it and was sort of like metal adjacent. And on the gaming side of things, we had Guitar Hero with Dragon Force as the biggest band of the game. Rock Band also had tons of metal bands on the soundtrack, plus games like Need for Speed, Tony Hawk, GTA 3, and Halo 2 that all prominently featured metal songs on their soundtracks. And so the point that I want to make here is that in terms of popularity and relevance in just sort of larger pop culture, metal was just on another level in the 2000s. It was legitimately part of mainstream pop culture in a way that just hasn't been true since then. It was on MTV next to the biggest hip hop and pop stars of the era to sort of draw kids into the scene. And then the people who were especially interested would go down the funnel and maybe check out one of those package tours. And that was the beginning of how they got into the scene. <laughs> Prepare for the darkest hour of your life. But it wasn't just the commercial popularity that made metal so special in the 2000s. I also think that the 2000s were probably the peak of metal in terms of creativity and just overall evolving the genre. Because if you think about it, the 2000s are when almost all of the subgenres that we now think of as defining modern metal were established. And really quick, before I talk about that, if you like this video so far, please subscribe. Just hit that button right there. It helps the channel a lot and will help make sure that you don't miss any of my videos. The first one of those subgenres genres that I want to point out is metalcore, which had been kind of brewing in the 90s hardcore scene with bands like Earth Crisis, Marauder, Ringworm, All Out War, and Integrity, among others, who first started combining punk with metal influences like Slayer, Pantera, Prong, and Crowbar. And that idea is obviously nothing new these days, but back then it was revolutionary because at the time metal and punk were really kind of like mortal enemies. Like if you listen to guys from the eighties talk about it, they'll tell you about how going to a punk show with long hair could get you beat up. And so when all those bands that I mentioned came along and put together the pissed off energy of punk with the precision and chunky riffs of metal, it was amazing. It was like the best of both worlds, but just like most things that are sort of on the bleeding edge, it was not popular. Realistically, these were like really tiny bands. I saw all of them at their peak and they would be lucky to draw 500 people on a good night. That's not putting them down at all. I'm just saying they were a little bit ahead of their curve. But in the 2000s, all of that changed as metalcore became something pretty close to mainstream. First, it was the so-called new wave of American heavy metal, which if you ask me, wasn't exactly metal because it was bands like Kill Switch Engage, Lamb of God, As I Lay Dying, and God Forbid, who all came from the 90s hardcore scene. But I understand why it was sort of branded as metal because musically what they were doing was much more polished than any of the 90s bands and certainly leaned a lot more towards metal than hardcore. This And as much as I loved all the 90s metalcore bands, I mean, like, that's literally how I grew up, as you can see from all the flyers behind me. There's no question that these second generation metalcore bands built on what they did and took it to a whole new level in terms of songwriting, combining the riffs of melodic death metal with the breakdowns of hardcore and just kind of like big rock choruses that anyone could sing along to. And the metalcore bands didn't quite hit the same levels of popularity as the new metal bands did, but still, these were definitely not underground bands. Kill Switch went platinum and hit the Billboard Top 10 twice. Lamb of God and As I Lay Dying also hit the Top 10. These bands were doing legit numbers, but probably the biggest band out of the 2000s metalcore scene was Avenged Sevenfold, who somehow managed to become MTV stars and actually beat Chris Brown and Rihanna for the Best New Artist Award in 2006. And the winner is... Oh, yeah, did you say that? Um... Avenged Sevenfold, Sevenfold. Backcountry! Back 
And to me, it was really cool to see all these bands that came from the same scene as I did cross over like that. These are guys that I remember all coming up playing these like tiny crappy little VFW shows in the 90s to now hitting the billboard charts and playing with the biggest metal bands in the world. I felt like I was like cheering for my hometown boys that just won the championship. And then a few years after those bands, there was the next generation of metalcore. These so-called scene bands who came up on MySpace, like the Devil Wars Prada, Asking Alexandria of Mice and Men, and of course, Bring Me the Horizon. In my opinion, those bands didn't quite have the same level of songwriting as bands like Killswitch did, but I do think they brought a very fresh energy to the scene and a whole new wave of kids that sort of didn't buy into all the dogmatic thinking about metal that the previous generations did, and their approach to production, especially the stuff that Joey Sturgis produced, that was revolutionary. All that stuff changed the way that metal sounded forever, to where now the expectation and ability of even a local band was that they could have a really crisp, punchy, modern recording even if they didn't have a big label budget. And aside from metalcore, in the mid-2000s, we also saw the rise of deathcore, with the first band to really put the genre on the map being Job for a Cowboy in 2005 with Entombment of a Machine. <laughs> And along with Job for a Cowboy, there were also all the OG MySpace deathcore bands like Whitechapel, Carnifex, Winds of Plague, and in my opinion, the kings of deathcore, Suicide Silence. And as you might guess from the name, deathcore was basically the more extreme equivalent of metalcore, combining the breakdowns and groove of hardcore with the guttural vocals and brutal riffing of death metal. And just like with metalcore, this wasn't a brand new idea. Hardcore bands like Day of Suffering, Prayer for Cleansing, and Abnegation started doing this in the late 90s. But once again, the 2000s is where they took that start that the bands of the 90s did and took it to another level in terms of both songwriting and popularity. Because just to be clear, to say that those 90s deathcore pioneering bands were small, that would be an understatement. They were smaller than smaller than small. I saw almost all those bands and there were literally like 75 people at a lot of those shows, sometimes not even that. Whereas in the 2000s, these deathcore bands were headlining decent sized tours. And in the case of Suicide Silence, Silence, they actually even hit the Billboard Top 20 once. And if you remember what I said earlier about how a lot of what happened in the 2000s is still kind of the foundation of modern metal, this is a great example. One of the biggest breakout bands in the last few years is Lorna Shore. And what they're doing with the symphonic deathcore thing, to me, is essentially a more refined version of what bands like Winds of Plague were doing almost 15 years ago. And that's not taking anything away from Lorna Shore. I think they're amazing and I love them. My point is just that so many of the seeds of what we think of as the most innovative part of modern metal now were actually laid back in the 2000s. Another big development of the 2000s was Gent, which if you're not familiar is essentially a subgenre of progressive metal named after the sound that you get when you play a palm muted chug through a high gain amp, like Gent Gent. And the founding fathers of Gent, I would say, are Tesseract, Sixth, Monuments, and Periphery, all of which started in the mid to late 2000s. And this stuff was very obscure back then. Basically, it was really only known to like turbo guitar nerds who hung out on forums, but it became extremely influential over the last 10 years or so, to the point where really like 90% of modern metal these days is some combination of Slipknot, Linkin Park, Bring Me the Horizon, and Meshuga. Basically, just remixing bands from the 2000s, but with with hyper-polished modern production. Which brings us to the last question. If metal did peak in the 2000s, what does that mean for the future of the genre? And just to be clear, I'm not saying that all metal that came out after the 2000s sucks or anything like that, because I don't think that's true at all. But I do think that every genre kind of follows a natural progression where it has a period of wild innovation and popularity, and then it flattens out. 
For example, look at punk. It came out in the 70s and blew everybody's minds with bands like the Sex Pistols and Ramones and The Clash that sort of turned all the conventions about bloated 70s music on its head and then continued to flourish in the 80s when hardcore came out, Black Flag, Dead Kennedys, Misfits, and so forth, and eventually went mainstream in the 90s when Green Day, The Offspring, and Blink-182 blew up. And yes, punk still exists and there are plenty of people out there making great punk songs, but I think it's pretty fair to say that the genre of punk peaked a long time ago. I would say probably in the 80s, at the very latest by the 90s, in terms of both creativity and commercial success. And I think the same is probably true of metal. I think the 2000s were very likely the peak of metal in terms of commercial success, with it being all over MTV, magazines, and video games, and also creatively, with so many of the most innovative genres like metalcore and deathcore coming into their own during that decade. And again, if you like modern metal, I think that is totally cool. I'm not here to tell you to stop stop liking anything that you like. But if you were around to see the 2000s metal scene firsthand, I say count yourself lucky because that was probably a once in a lifetime event. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, please let me know what you think in the comments. Also, I would like to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. Patrons get all my videos and podcasts early. There are members only channels in my discord that I'm super active in. I do giveaways sometimes, I do Q and A's, and there's also a way to have me review your music. So if any of that sounds cool, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.